Welcome to Animals Today, your home for serious talk about animals. I'm Dr. Lori Kirshner. A couple summers ago, one of my friend's dogs, Simon, ate a couple pieces of chocolate cake that was left on the kitchen counter. My friend discovered what happened when she got home from work to have lunch with her dog, and she saw that the plastic wrapped around the cake and the pieces of cake were gone. Well, my friend knew, as most of us know, that chocolate is highly toxic and potentially lethal to dogs. So she immediately tried to call her veterinarian, but they were closed for lunch, so she called the Pet Poison Helpline. And keep in mind, the dog appeared to be fine. Simon was let out to relieve himself, and he had a normal bowel movement, and again, he seemed to be acting the same as usual. Well, I'll just tell you that things got bad and scary a few hours later. But thankfully, after spending a few nights in the veterinary hospital, being monitored and treated for any symptoms, Simon was and is okay. And later we'll talk more about chocolate, like how much chocolate is really toxic for dogs? I'll tell you, it's much less than you'd think. But do you really have to worry if your medium-sized dog eats one milk chocolate chip from a cookie that fell on the floor? And did you know that dry cocoa powder is actually the most toxic of all chocolates. All it takes is one ounce of cocoa powder to kill a 16-pound dog, or as little as 0.14 ounce, that's four grams of cocoa powder, can actually cause toxic effects in a 10-pound dog. And your big 70-pound dog with just one lick of his tongue can get enough cocoa powder to potentially kill him. So we're going to talk about chocolate a little bit later in the show, but back to the topic today. Accidents happen, and despite your best efforts, your companion animal can come into contact with a potentially poisonous substance. And to help raise awareness of common hazards and toxins to pets, the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center has put together a list of the top 10 most commonly reported pet toxins. So let's talk about these. What do you think is the most common pet poison in your household? The most common group of toxins that pets ingest year after year? Over-the-counter medications meant for humans, including ibuprofen, acetaminophen, cold medications, joint creams and lotions, and herbal supplements. These are commonly used human medications. Most of us have acetaminophen, right? That's Tylenol or ibuprofen. That's Advil, Motrin. There are many brand names of ibuprofen. And a lot of us have these gels or creams you rub on your skin over sore joints. How easy is it for your dog to access that bottle of pills at your bedside or ingest that little packet of Tylenol in your purse or grab and puncture that tube of cream on your countertop? It's so easy and so common. This is the number one cause of poisoning in our pets. Medication should not be left on the countertop or in areas reachable by your pet, including backpacks, purses, or whatever left on the chairs or on the floor. We've talked on the show about lotions and creams that contain various medications for human use, which can pose serious risks to dogs and cats. So there are several topical creams or ointments that contain common and potent ingredients known as the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. Examples include Diclofenac, this comes in many brand names, including Volterin, Fluorbiprofen, which is similar to Motrin and Advil and Naprosyn. These are ingredients commonly found in creams used to relieve sore joints and muscles. These can be very toxic to your pets. You rub these creams or gels right on your skin or your joints, and they can cause toxic reactions and even death when they're licked off your skin by our dog or cat or absorbed through the skin of the pet after direct contact with your skin. And then you have these hormone applications or substances, creams, which contain estrogen or testosterone and other hormones, same thing. A few years back, we spoke to a veterinarian about a set of diseases being seen more and more frequently in dogs and cats, and that is exposure to human hormone replacement therapy. These also come in the form of lotions and creams that you rub on yourself. And patches also, hormone patches. How easily do these patches unknowingly fall off your body when you come out of the shower and your dog sees it and scoops it up? 
And then you have all these herbal supplements or Chinese herbal therapy. These claim they can do everything from soothing your sore throat, aiding with weight loss, anxiety, pain, sleep, whatever. Many people feel comfortable with the idea of all natural or organic, whatever these marketing terms mean, form of remedy. And herbal medicines are readily available and don't require prescription from your doctor. Some people like that. But keep in mind, herbal supplements could also potentially kill your pet if consumed by your pet. Alpha lipoic acid, ALA, often sold as an herbal supplement, also is an antioxidant, can cause low blood sugar and liver damage and potentially lethal in dogs and cats. Tea extract, tea tree oil, white willow bark, I can go on. Even marijuana and cannabinoids are very toxic to our pets. So don't let the terms natural and herbal fool you. You might think you're doing something good for you, but can be very dangerous for pets. So human over-the-counter medication is the most frequent cause of pet poisoning. And so not surprising, the second most common pet toxin, according to the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center, is human prescription medication. With antidepressant, anticonvulsant, and heart medication ingestions being the most common cases. ADHD meds and thyroid meds also make up a significant amount of cases reported. Make sure your prescription medications and all your over-the-counter medications are safely locked away and out of your pet's reach. And I'll tell you, we human doctors, we don't know this stuff. We don't know what's potentially toxic to your pet. And we don't think about this when we're prescribing these medications to our patients. We're thinking about how to treat your ailments. We're not thinking about what happens if your pet at home accidentally consumes the medication we prescribed for you. And I'll tell you a personal story here. My father's doctor recently prescribed a pre-cancer killing medication cream for my father to apply in his hands. This prescription medication is the class of medication called fluorouracil, and it can go under many names. And I thought, okay, my father's supposed to rub this anti-cancer cream on his hands twice a day. And, oh, by the way, my dad has an adorable little white rescued 15-pound, loves to make kisses, loves to be held dog called Chiclet. So toxic cream on hands that's supposed to kill pre-cancer cells and little dog who is often found in those very hands or is often licking those hands doesn't appear to be a smart or safe combination. And after about 10 seconds of research, I read that the FDA issued a warning specifically about these very skin cancer creams and the dangers they pose to pets. So I communicated this with my dad's physician and said, Hey, I noticed you suggested my father use the fluorouracil cream on his hands. You might not be aware of this, but the FDA recently issued several warnings to pet owners that skin cancer creams like Eufidex and fluorouracil are highly toxic to pets. And I explained to him that apparently over the past couple years, there have been dozens of dogs and cats and other small animals who have died or have become extremely ill after licking the skin of someone who has used this class of medication. And in other cases, a pet owner may apply cream on his skin and then handle his pet. The dog then groomed his fur, ingesting the medication, and becomes sick or dies. And I told my dad's doctor about Chiclet, who is often handled by my dad, And my father's doctor said he was not aware of the risk of fluorouracil in these other applications to dogs and pets, and he appreciated me letting him know. So just be mindful that keeping your pet safe is not on your doctor's mind when they prescribe a medication to you. And in this particular case, when we're dealing with a very strong anti-cancer cream, it might seem obvious to you and me this could be risky for our pets. But other medications and supplements and applications might not be so obvious. So just assume every medication that's meant for you will harm or kill our pet if he consumes it. Number three on the list of most common pet toxins or poisons, food. Xylitol. How many times have you heard me talk about xylitol being toxic to our pets? We talked about foods that may contain xylitol. It's present in many foods, and you don't know unless you look at the ingredients. Your peanut butter might have xylitol. Did you know that? Your pudding snacks 
ice cream might contain xylitol. How would you feel, oh my God, if you give your dog a tiny bit of ice cream because you know he just enjoys it so much and you find out it contains xylitol? Sugar-free cake mixes, sugar-free candy and mints often contain xylitol. Chewing gum, human toothpaste and mouthwash commonly contain xylitol. It's great to get into the habit of brushing your dog's teeth, but never use human toothpaste. So xylitol is a big one. Did you know grapes, raisins, onions, garlic are also toxic to pets? They also have on the list protein bars and snack bars as a very common food toxin to pets. I don't know what's in protein bars that make them toxic. Oh, maybe because of xylitol. Xylitol in many protein bars. Oh, also chocolate or cocoa in the protein bars. And we're going to get to chocolate after the break. But look in the ingredients before deciding to give your pet a taste of certain human foods. Grapes, raisins, onions, garlic, very dangerous for pets. Onion and garlic powder are often added to a lot of foods to make them taste better. So look at the ingredients. Here's a good example. Cats usually love the taste of meat-based baby food. And cat owners might find out that many times baby food will be the only thing your cat will eat when he's sick. Many of the baby foods come with seasonings like onion powder and garlic powder. I read that an onion, onion powder, can become toxic to a cat if more than one gram per five pounds of body weight is ingested. That's such a small amount of onion powder. If you ever weighed out one gram of anything like sugar or flour, you'll see it's an incredibly small amount. So you want to make sure the baby food you're buying is just water and chicken or water and the meat. When one of our cats, 21-year-old Margarita, was nearing the end of her beautiful life and fighting with health issues, she stopped eating her kibble or any wet food, but she would eat a teaspoon of baby food and just loved it. So most commonly reported pet toxins, that's what we're talking about today on Animals Today. More of this right after the break. Welcome back. We're talking about the 10 most commonly reported pet toxins. Number one is over-the-counter human medication, including ibuprofen, acetaminophen, joint creams and lotions, and herbal supplements. Number two on the list, human prescription medications, including heart meds, ADHD meds, thyroid and antidepressant medications. Anna Brutlag is Director of Veterinary Services and Senior Veterinary Toxicologist for the Pet Poison Helpline, said last year that about 40% of their calls are from owners whose pets get into medications intended for human use. She said someone accidentally drops a pill on the floor and the dog gets it or someone leaves a pill left on the counter and the cat tongues them up. She says sometimes it's double play, the cat bats them off the counter and then the dog eats them off the floor. But more commonly, a dog will simply chew open a bottle of pills, be it aspirin, blood pressure medication, and so on, and wolf down the contents. Keep all medications in cabinets or drawers. They shouldn't be left on the countertop or in areas reachable by your pet, including backpacks or purses left on the chairs or on the floor. Next common pet toxin we talked about is food. We talked about xylitol, grapes, raisins, onions, or onion and garlic powder. Chocolate. Let's talk about chocolate. According to the list, about one out of 10 calls into the Animal Poison Control Center involves chocolate. And they say here that's about 67 cases per day. So just know that chocolate is pretty toxic for our pets. And how toxic it is to your pet depends on the type of chocolate, the amount of chocolate consumed, and the weight of your pet. Why is chocolate so toxic to our dogs? Chocolate is toxic because it contains a chemical called theobromine, as well as caffeine. Humans easily metabolize theobromine, but dogs have a hard time metabolizing it, as well as the caffeine, so it builds up to toxic levels in their systems. Now, different chocolate types have different theobromine levels. Cocoa, 
cooking chocolate and dark chocolate contain the highest levels of theobromine, while milk chocolate and white chocolate have the lowest levels. But the darker and more bitter the chocolate, the more dangerous it is to the dogs. Baking chocolate and gourmet dark chocolate have highly concentrated amount of theobromine per ounce. Just to give you an idea, I read that less than one ounce of dark chocolate may be enough to poison a 44-pound dog. So let's say a medium-sized dog weighing 50 pounds would only need to eat one ounce of baker's chocolate or nine ounces of milk chocolate to potentially show signs of poisoning. Now, for many dogs, eating that one milk chocolate chip that fell on the floor while you're making cookies is probably not harmful. Symptoms of chocolate poisoning may include diarrhea, vomiting, muscle tremors, seizures, irregular heartbeat, internal bleeding, or a heart attack. The onset of theobromine poisoning is usually marked by severe hyperactivity, but fatalities have been seen at around 200 milligrams per kilogram. And again, like I said, depending on the type of chocolate, it doesn't take a lot of chocolate to kill your pet. If your dog ingests chocolate, call your veterinarian or the Pet Poison Helpline or the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center immediately. You should look up those numbers and put them in your phone now. Pet Poison Helpline, ASPCA's Animal Poison Control Center, and they'll help you figure it out if a poisonous amount of chocolate was ingested. If a toxic amount is ingested, you should have your dog examined by a veterinarian immediately. The sooner the theobromine is removed from the body and the dog is stabilized, the better your dog's prognosis. Number five on the list of pet poisons is plants. Now, this is interesting. Plants, both indoor and outdoor plants, moved up three spots on the list of top 10 pet toxins in 2020. With the Animal Poison Control Center seeing 9,000 more plant-related calls compared to the previous year. They say that at the start of the pandemic, more people found themselves decorating with plants or sending bouquets to friends and family. So know which are the plants that might pose a serious threat to pets, dogs, cats, and horses too. Common toxic plants include sago palms, lilies, azaleas, tulips, oleander, marijuana. The most common severe cases involved cats and lily exposures. But there are a lot of plants out there that are potentially toxic to our pets. Let me say a few words about marijuana. We're seeing more and more states legalizing marijuana. And with this crazy pandemic, more people turning to substance use. So you can see why there's an increase in marijuana pet poisoning ingestion cases. THC, the most potent psychoactive cannabinoid in marijuana, can be absorbed orally, but also through inhalation, same way as humans get high. Bring your pet to a hospital if you think your pet has inhaled or ingested a substance containing marijuana. Next pet poison on the list, veterinary products like chewable pet medications. These are made to be tasty, so our pets will take the prescribed medication. But if allowed, your dog might eat more than prescribed and even the entire container. Make sure to treat these products like prescription medications and keep them away from your pets. The last four pet toxins on the list of top 10 pet poisons include household items such as cleaning products and paint, rodenticides, insecticides, and gardening products, including fertilizer. So when we come back after the break, I want to talk a little bit about rodenticides and insecticides. But just know that cleaning products, paint, adhesives, spackle, these household items make up about 7% of the Animal Poison Control Center's cases. And garden and lawn products, also on the list of the top 10 poisons, Many pets find fertilizers, especially organic products, irresistible. Keep your pets away from the herbicides and soil enhancements. Oh, this is so interesting. Real quick before we take a break, the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center saw a 13% increase in case volume in 2020 as adoption and foster rates increased and pet owners spent more time at home due to the pandemic. 
So ASPCA reports that because of the pandemic and pet owners were spending a significant amount of time at home in 2020 and people were taking up new hobbies such as baking and gardening and thus pets had more access to potentially toxic items such as chocolate, yeast dough, and indoor and outdoor plants. So there was an 11% increase in cases involving chocolate, a 51% increase in cases involving yeast dough, and a 40% increase in cases involving plants in 2020 compared to the prior year. Additionally, ASPCA reports adoption and foster rates were positively impacted by the pandemic with more people adding pets to the household, contributing to an overall increase in cases in 2020. That's really significant. Don't go away. I'm going to tell you a little story about our Susie, Susie Q, we called her, who got into a bait station filled with a deadly pesticide and what you need to know to keep your pet safe from pesticides and insecticides. You're listening to Animals Today. For the past three decades, International Society for Animal Rights has fought the battle against dog and cat overpopulation. ISAR is committed to informing the public about the overpopulation program and the spay-neuter solution through outdoor advertising. For a list of all ISAR overpopulation programs, please see their website at www.isaronline.com. sound of a dog whose vocal cords were cut just to stifle her voice. It's called devocalization, and it's done to cats as well. Devocalized animals rasp and wheeze, cough and gag for the rest of their lives. Some are rendered mute. And for what? So a commercial or hobby breeder can keep many animals without having to listen to them? So show dogs will be quiet during transit between shows or in the ring? So an irresponsible pet owner can leave a dog alone for hours every day? Animals Today says shame on anyone who would have a dog or cat devocalized and shame on the veterinarians who perform this unnecessary, inhumane surgery on them. Please speak out against devocalization of dogs and cats. Use your voice to protect theirs. This message is brought to you by Advancing the Interests of Animals. Visit them at AIanimals.org. That's AIanimals.org. Welcome back. One of the top 10 pet poisons reported by the ASPCA Pet Poison Control Center is rodenticide exposure. Depending on the type, mouse and rat baits can cause bleeding, kidney failure, seizures, or even death to your dog or cat. Obviously, you want to keep mouse and rat poisons well out of reach of pets, and some of the poisons come with a plastic bait station. Do you know what a bait station is? A bait station's not a trap. It's a device that holds bait, which is poison, and the purpose is that it's supposed to provide easy access for the rat or rodent or squirrel or whatever you're trying to poison, but protect children and pets from accessing the bait. But pets, especially dogs, can easily chew through the bait station and get to the poison. I'm going to tell you a little story of our experience with pesticide exposure with one of our dogs, Susie. Our beloved wild girl, Susie, got into a bait station out on one of our walks. And this bait station was set out by the city to prevent squirrels from damaging a nearby levee. These particular bait stations were made of PVC piping and they were T-shaped. Have you ever seen these? It's actually a reverse T-shape. So picture this. You have the center vertical pipe sticking up into the air. That's where you insert the poison, which is supposed to fall to the bottom, where it's connected to the center of the horizontal pipe line on the ground, which opens at both ends. So the rodent has two points of entry and exit. And you don't expect to find dead rodents in these bait stations because the way it works is the animal enters the station, eats some bait, leaves the station, and usually goes back to its nest or out somewhere else where it dies a day or two later. And it's a horrible death for the animal, I should add. Don't think for a second this is a painless way for an animal to die. Now, 
This particular poison that Susie got into, we found out, consisted of oats, like breakfast oats, saturated with a cobalt blue substance. And Susie shoved her snout into the dispenser before we knew what happened and what it was. Not sure how much she consumed, but she definitely got a few licks in. Anyway, you know you got to act quickly if you think your pet just ingested poison. You can't wait for symptoms before you act. So we rushed Susie to our vet. I mean, we were at the vet's office within 20 minutes of this event. And the vet immediately induced vomiting and placed Susie on a month of vitamin K therapy. And luckily, she was fine. This particular poison was an anticoagulant rodenticide, which prevents the animal to clot his own blood, which eventually leads to internal bleeding. And like I said, it's a horrible way to die. So what vitamin K does, it's supposed to reverse the anticoagulant effect of the poison. So Susie was fine, but imagine if we didn't see this happen, and imagine what these poisons do to our wildlife. We have coyotes all around us here where we live. We see them all the time in this area. So I'm positive coyotes access this poison in the same way our Susie did. A couple of years ago, we had an environmental health legal director, Jonathan Evans, on the show. He works with Center for Biological Diversity to protect imperiled wildlife from the threats of environmental contamination and reduce the toxic threats of pesticides. He spoke to us about the different types of rodenticides used and how to safely and humanely deal with rodent problems in your home. But he made the point that bait stations are everywhere, and these rodenticides are getting into the environment, getting into our families and our pets and kids in ways we don't even know about, and with widespread exposure rate. And these pesticides, poisons, are really ubiquitous, even if you're not using them yourself around or in your own home. There are bait products around restaurants and grocery stores and outdoor areas like parks and near and around levees. And going back to my point about directly harming our wildlife, so the way it usually works, the rodents first get to the poisons, okay? And these guys are preyed upon by the upper-level predators, foxes, coyotes, eagles, hawks, bobcats. And these animals will ingest the toxins when they capture and eat the poison rodents. And then these animals get very sick and experience a painful, slow death. So you can see how it becomes very widespread in the food chain. And people don't think about that. They don't think about the widespread impact it has on our wildlife because people usually just want to get rid of the pests and rodents around them. But remember, it's particularly harmful to our wildlife, the very animals and species whose job it is to keep the rodent population down. Our dogs and cats are getting into these pesticides. And as I mentioned at the top of the segment, rodenticides are in the top 10 toxins that harm our pets. So if you think your cat or dog has been exposed to a rodenticide, you should seek treatment with your veterinarian immediately or call the Pet Poison Helpline or the Animal Poison Control Center. Put these numbers in your phone. Pet Poison Helpline or the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center. Also on the show, we've talked about the risks that pesticides pose to our dogs and cats with veterinarian Robert Reed and what precautions you should take when your home or surroundings is treated to address pest problems. You could check that interview out or the one with Jonathan Evans if you want to learn more about pesticides and wildlife by going to our podcast, animalstodayradio.com. And there's a search box on the top right upper corner and type in pesticides. And you can access both of these interviews on animalstodayradio.com. You know, we live in a suburban house in the desert and started noticing mouse or rat droppings in our garage. So we elected to get a few of those no-kill traps. They're humane, no poison, no kill, no crushing, no harming the animal. And we used peanut butter as bait. And it works. Rack goes in, little cage door closes, and you check several hours later. Peter actually caught a few rodents in about two weeks. Each one he humanely released, of course, just far enough away in a rodent safe and happy place. And it's 
been over a year since that happened, and we haven't seen any more signs of rodents so far. And of course, we're very happy we can do this without the traps which can injure or kill the rodent, and without using or having poisons around the house. And finally, one of the 10 most common pet toxins, insecticide exposure. Insecticides are designed to kill insects, and they are used everywhere, your home, gardens, parks, and you know how easy it would be for your dog to inhale or ingest insecticide debris left on some grass or on a treated plant. Do you have a pest control service that comes to your home or your apartment to spray? Or maybe your HOA schedules that and they spray common areas in your community? The exterminator might tell you that what they use is harmless to pets. Don't believe them. Pets poisoned from insecticides are on this top 10 pet poison list. So you know pets are getting into these insecticides or the insecticides are getting on the dog's paws or bodies and perhaps they're grooming themselves in many ways to be poisoned. One resource is offering good advice. Never apply outdoor insecticides while your pet, any toys, or feeding bowls are on the lawn. Avoid pellet pesticides that can be mistaken for food. Don't mix insecticides with organic fertilizer. Most dogs like the taste of organic fertilizers. When storing insecticides, make sure they are out of reach and locked up so that children and animals cannot access them. And then there are these spot-on flea and tick treatments meant for your dog. Is that safe? A friend of mine's dog died from a flea and tick product application. So personally, I would never use one on my dog. There's so many non-toxic ways to treat your pet from ticks and fleas, or I would just ask your trusted veterinarian what he recommends if the time comes you feel your dog needs flea treatment. And by the way, there's a nasty chemical called permethrin, which is often used in these flea and tick treatments for dogs. Cats are highly susceptible to permethrin poisoning, even through skin contact. So if you have a cat and a dog in the same household, definitely look for safer alternatives for your home. So permethrin, remember that name, highly toxic to cats. Permethrin is found in some dog flea and tick treatments, some dog shampoos, fly sprays, and ant powder. Exposure to even small quantities of concentrated permethrin can cause severe and fatal poisoning in cats. So common pet poisons and toxins, we need to be aware of them. We love our pets. It's important to keep any potential danger and toxins out of our pet's reach. The less accessible these toxins are to our pet, the less likely your pet is going to get into them. If you think your pet may have ingested a potentially poisonous substance, seek immediate veterinary treatment or call the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center or Pet Poison Helpline. I'll tell you the numbers, but obviously you can easily look them up online. ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center, 888-426-4435. Pet Poison Helpline, 855-764-7661, 855-764-7661, Animal Poison Control Center and Pet Poison Helpline. Put these numbers in your phone, tape it to your refrigerator. Do people do that anywhere? Tape it to the refrigerator? Leave the numbers for your pet sitter. That's a good idea. Leave the numbers for your pet sitter. Give them to your friends with pets. The ASPC Animal Poison Control Center is probably your best resource for any animal poison-related emergency, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, 888-427-4435. Also, Pet Poison Helpline, always available to you, 855-764-7661. More with animals today, right after the break. Peter. 
Peter, I heard a song that I haven't heard in years, mm -hmm. and I can't get it out of my head. Okay, that could be good or bad. And why are we talking about this? Because it has an animal in the title. Okay, okay, that makes sense. So I want you to guess it. Okay. Foxy Lady. <laughs> the first word yes. of the title of the song is rock. Rock Lobster. Right. Okay. <laughs> By whom? The B-52s. Exactly. When's the last time you heard that song? Yesterday. Really? I like the B-52s. Oh, okay. I've got one of their CDs, maybe two. I saw the B-52s not long ago at the Hollywood Bowl. And, Without uh, me. Yeah. It was really good. Fred still got his cowbell. He doesn't move as much as he used to, but it was really fun. Is he heavy or just old or both? Well, we're all getting older. He looks pretty darn good, I have to say. Yeah. Well, I have some of the best songs ever with an animal in the song title. So you're going to guess. I hope it's from my era. It is. Okay, good. So you're going to guess the name of the song title and who sang it. Mm. Okay, ready? Shoot. The name of the song is a sleek fish with an elongated body, mm. a mouth full of sharp teeth, and they resemble underwater torpedoes. Oh, shark, shark, porpoise, sharp teeth. Okay, let me know. Barracuda. Oh, Barracuda. By? By heart. Good. Okay, next. Large prehistoric looking reptile that are found throughout the world's hottest tropical regions. Mm. Large. Large. Oh, alligator. Crocodile rock. Ah, very crocodile good. Rock. Crocodile okay. rock. Elton Bye. John. Good, Elton John. good. Okay. 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 This animal is a wild carnivorous mammal of the dog family living and hunting in packs. First get the animal. Mm. Yeah. Then you can get the That's song title. Dog. Wolf. Right. Wolf. Hungry like the wolf. Yes. Good. Okay, Duran Duran. Very okay. good. All You're right. good at this. Just stay in this zone. Like n nothing more recent than 1995. It's and I'm not. Okay. They're not. Okay. The males of this species may learn 200 songs in his lifetime. In addition to bird songs, these animals have been heard to mimic frogs, insects, and even non animal noises such as car alarms. Oh. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, they are robins? No. That's uh, a good guess. No. Um, a parrot. No. Um, toucan. Macaw. Uh, uh, I tell you what it starts with? Yeah. M. That doesn't help okay. me. Sorry. <laughs> M. Is it a bird? Did you yes. say bird? It's a bird. It has bird in its name. Oh, mockingbird. Good. Oh, Bye. Yeah. Oh, boy. I know that uh, James Taylor yes. and Carly Simon. Good. Were, did they write it? Yes. I don't, oh, wow. Good. Wow. That was a good one. The weight of this bird is less than a penny. <laughs> That's a hummingbird? Yes. And That's a song? Yep. Oh, I don't know anything about that song. Seals and Cross. Oh. Oh, yeah. Remember now? Mm-hmm. The word pinniped means fin or flipper-footed and refers to the marine mammals that have front and rear flippers. This group includes seals, sea lions, and... Seals, uh, sea lions, and... Walruses. Oh, yeah. I'm the walrus. Very good. Okay. By? By the Beatles. Is that the Beatles or Paul McCartney or John Lennon or do you know? You know what? I just assumed it was the Beatles. Mm. Let's ask Yoko. But don't ask her to sing it. No. There are about 59 different species of this bird throughout the world. Large birds of prey and mm -hmm. excellent vision. Yes. Fly like an eagle. Very good. By? By Steve Miller. Very good. Yeah. That's right in the sweet spot of my, uh, of my song knowledge. Scientific name of this animal is Procyon Loader. Mm. Means washer dog. Washer. Although it is a closer relative to the bear family. Oh, is that a, like a beaver or a... Close. Or an otter? No, a, uh, a raccoon? Yes. Oh, Rocky Raccoon. Very good. Bye. <laughs> Same thing. Those beetle people. Okay, <laughs> the beetle people. <laughs> Large oceanic bird starts with the letter A. Albatross. Very good. Bye. Ooh, I don't know that song, Albatross. Oh, that's... I have no, no idea. Fluid Mac. Okay. 
1962, the controversial book Silent Spring by Rachel Carson was published, right? I remember that. It documented the adverse effects on the environment of the indiscriminate use of pesticides. Yep. She noted threats to some birds like eagles and other raptors, but she warned that one of the most common American birds, this bird, was on the verge of extinction, and hence the title, since these birds would be silent and wouldn't be singing. What bird is this? Bird that sings a lot, like Rob Robin. Yeah. Uh, she, I didn't know she talked about robins. That was the name of you know her book, Silent Spring, uh-huh. indicating that uh, the pesticide would kill all the robins and oh. spring would be silent. Oh, okay. Now it makes sense. Yeah. Oh, I think I, I think I read that too. Oh, Rock and Robin. Bye. Okay. Bye. I'm gonna say the Jackson Five. Very good. Okay. A small, like two to four inches, ground-dwelling member of the squirrel family known for their burrowing habits and love of nuts. Gopher? Um, are you a... It's a good guess. Um... (laughs) High voices. Oh... Chipmunk. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that okay. that was a good clue. Okay. Chipmunk. By the Oh. That's the name of the song, Chipmunk? Yeah. Mm. The Chipmunk song by the Chipmunks. Okay. okay. <laughs> is it like is that like a a theme song to their cartoon or something like that? Or probably. These animals are semi aquatic rodents. Named for their musky smell and rat-like appearance. They're known mostly for their destructive burrowing in ponds, streams, and dams. Okay. Is musky smell a hint? Not muskrat. Yes. Oh. Muskrat love. Very good. By? Yes. By uh, Captain and Tennille? Yep. Yeah. That was a funny duo right there. Was that like a one-hit wonder? No, they had a, they had their, they had a run of... A, those are sappy, funny little 70s songs. Yeah. These animals have a head called mantle mm-hmm. surrounded with eight arms called tentacles. Eight. Well, eight is octopus. Very good. And? Octopus. Octopus's garden. Yep. By? Those lads from Liverpool. Very good. Okay. These animals are primarily exploited and abused as farm animals, mainly for their wool and meat, and to some extent, their byproducts like cheese and milk. Oh, uh, sheep? Yep. Sheep. Sheep. There's a sheep from Pink Floyd, isn't there? Yep. Okay. Got it. Yep. I like that one. What animal does the president pardon every year the most ridiculous White House tradition? (laughs) The turkey. There's a turkey song. Yeah, there's a turkey song. Turkey. um, I can give you another hint. Okay. When you abruptly and completely stop taking a drug you're addicted to. Oh, you go cold turkey. They yes, by Cold turkey. I don't remember that one. I know. John Lennon. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, Peter, unfortunately, we're out of time. I'm afraid I'm going to have to give you a B minus for today's quiz. But there'll be another one soon. So until then, I'm Dr. Lori Kirshner, encouraging you to nurture your love and compassion for the only other beings sharing our planet, the animals. Thank you.